Hi, welcome to the Cows Podcast. I'm your host, Hunter Burney. A catalyst is defined as a person or thing that precipitates an event. A catalyst is something that it participates in a reaction, but does not get consumed in the reaction. There's a heart behind this podcast for you know people with aspirations. There's a heart behind this podcast for motivated people that want to make a difference, that have a bias for action, that really truly want to be a catalyst in the environment around them, both professionally and personally, in their homes, in their workplace, and beyond. So welcome to this podcast. I really hope you're enjoying the series that we're in. Welcome to this episode, and let's dive right in. All right, welcome back to this second episode with Rick Mauer. Uh, if you didn't catch the first episode, highly encourage you to go catch up there. Uh, what we're talking about here in, in this series is change management and really Rick's, Rick's experience around um, resistance and influence of change. Uh, so we, we kind of have framed things up, right, Rick, from the background, mm-hmm. uh, sort of how you got to your current platform. What I really like to shift to is understanding the core of, you know, your current platform, what it looks like, who you deal with. Um, and, you know, maybe we can get into some successes and things like that. Okay, great. I, um, I decided, uh, when I was studying Gestalt, they had a good, good language for resistance, but it was very psychological and, so we were making presentations at the end of this year and a half program. And I said, look, my clients would not ever take a step into, step into a, a school of psychology. So I'm trying to translate the language here. And mm-hmm. so I did. And one of the faculty members said, are you going to publish that? And I said, I didn't think about it. She said, I think you should. And I'd like you to publish with us. And I realized I did not want to be published by a, a place that said school of psychology. That would, my clients just wouldn't, you know, wouldn't go for it. <laughs> but but I appreciated that uh, that thought, and so I really started thinking, what do I have to say? And it was more than just translating it. It was I was starting to think differently about a model. W- what I was stick- stayed with, which comes out of the martial arts and also Gestalt, is the philosophy that you need to respect resistance. You need to respect why people are resisting, and you need to res- you re- need to respect the people who are resisting. And the resistance is happening in the dance between you and me. So if I say, oh, well, he's a resistor, suddenly I've, I've neatly removed myself from the equation, and that just doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And one of the big things I got from the martial arts as well as uh, in the psychology stuff was that one of the best ways to help get change, whether it's personal change or organizational change, is helping people and ourselves get fully in touch with what's going on in the present moment. Mm -hmm. Like, Oh, that's why this is going on. But we tend to short circuit that and we want to move right to action. Mm -hmm. So then we wonder why every year we have end up having the same new year's resolutions on our calendar. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's that kind of thing that there's something, a power in when we go, Oh, that's it. In fact, there's a guy, uh, Arnold, Arnold Beiser, he's now, uh, has been dead for a number of years, wrote a four page article called the paradoxical theory of change. And you can find it on the internet for free. It's, it's four pages. It's one of the most cited articles in all of Gestalt literature. And Mm -hmm. basically he's saying, you can't push people to change. Mm -hmm. And our job is to allow, to give people the tools to really take a look at what's going on. And so my work really is based on that thinking. Yeah. And the model that I came up with is I, I, I observed that there really are three kind of kinds of energy, if you will, going on when we're in a situation of trying to influence. And uh, I'm going to talk about the resistance side first because it's more memorable. Uh, there and these three, I call them levels. I wish I'd never called them levels because it makes it appear like I, I do level one, I check it off, I can go to level mm. two. If, all I mean by that is level one is the easiest, one level two is harder, level three is really hard. Okay, here's what they are 
First one is, I don't get it. I simply don't understand what you're talking about. And in some ways, that can be the easiest one. Like maybe I'm just using a different professional language. You're in finance and I'm in IT. You know, it's that kind of thing. Um, but, or it could just be different native languages. But, but often that's, that's one that we can, we can figure out what to do with pretty easily. One of the problems with that level one, I don't get it, is it's too easy to assume that all resistance means they don't get it. So I'll explain it again and I'll go, I'll go slow and use little words and it, it ins insults people. Yeah. You know? But it's just one, one part of resistance. The, the second level is critically important and that's, I don't like it. And that's more than, oh, I don't like Brussels sprouts. It's, it's an, I don't like it based on fear. Fear that I could lose my job, I could lose face, I could lose anything that's important to me. And when that happens, I mean, the, there's lots of really good brain research on this. Our brains go haywire. I realize that that's not a, a, a technical, technical term. term. But, <laughs> yeah, but what happens in those moments is what we're listening to is what's going on inside our heads. We are not listening to the speaker there saying, okay, and here's what the change is going to look like. Because I'm already going, we just bought a new house. What are we going to do? Mm. we got a kid in college. And organizations generally don't have a good way to help people actually talk honestly about their reactions. It's fine if they're excited. People love that kind of that reaction. Right. But the other one, it's nobody raises their hand in a meeting and says, ah, oh, I'm having a level two reaction. I mean, it just... It just doesn't happen. And, yeah. and yet that's often what's getting in the way mm. of stuff, you know, yeah. and the third, so I don't get it. I don't like it. The third one is I don't like you. And here the resistance may have nothing to do with the idea, but everything to do with our relationship. Mm. And that could be because of our history together. Like, Oh, here comes Rick. And he just, Oh, he read another book. Didn't he? Oh, he went to another workshop. Oh, here we go again. Or it could be, who I represent and have nothing to do with Rick Maurer as a person. Yeah. You know, hi, I'm from headquarters. I'm here to help. Yeah. Or when I work outside the United States and I get introduced by the client and said, Hey, we're really pleased to have Rick Maurer with us. He's from the United States. He's written books. And right away people go, Oh no, an author from the United States. And so the image, a lot of my clients have of, of consultants from the U United States is that we're arrogant. We think we have all the answers. Just um, yeah. And we, and we don't listen. And I, so it's in my best interest to not tell people, Hey, I'm really not like those other consultants that doesn't work, but I've got to start demonstrating that I'm doing something that confounds their expectations. Yeah. I mean, and it's, it's a critical part of my strategy because without that people will just sit there politely and and nothing will be happening. So that, that I don't get it, I don't like it, I don't like you, is the model. And the positive side very easily is that people obviously understand it, they like it, they're eager. And three, they, they have trust and confidence in the people leading this thing. Yeah. And, and all of those are alive, all, moving around all the time from beginning to end. Yeah, wow. I, I'm, I'm, a lot of things go off from my experience and, and kind of how you describe that. Um, and I love the way you've kind of simplified it to, like you're saying just now, it covers the trust, it covers the confidence. Um, you know, it, it, you're talking about bridging the understanding. Um, there's a lot that goes into that. So I, I like that you um, have kind of filtered it down to those. Can I tell you a story? Shoot. Yeah. It's all okay. yours. <laughs> all right. So when I was, uh, when I first, my book, Beyond the Wall of Resistance came out in 96. And Deloitte Consulting, one of the really large consulting firms, invited me to speak to some of their clients. And as, as they said, they would parachute me in. So they'd be working on a project, I would come in, and I would just teach my stuff. And I wouldn't be there working on the project with people. Well, so they were, this one team was working on a project called business process reengineering, which was very controversial at the time. And it just scared people. Just, the, I mean, everything in the press was negative about it. It was just, you know, a lot of bad stuff. So I'm just doing my presentation 
And this one guy on this planning team inside this large bureaucratic organization said, Rick, next week the bomb is going to drop. What should we do? And people are going, yeah, oh, it's going to be awful. Oh, just terrible. And these people are just going in this planning group, about 15 people. They're going, oh, yeah, he's right. There's blood everywhere. And, you know, and I said, what are you doing next week? And they said, we're holding a meeting. And I'm going, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, oh, it's an all day meeting. And we're inviting, this is the first meeting with the key stakeholders. And we're going to roll out the first draft of our business process engineering plan. Oh, they're going to hate it. Da, 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 da. Mm. And then like puppy dogs, they look at me and go, what should we do? And I mean, it would have been irresponsible for me to say, well, you know, on page 42 in my book is, I mean, it, plus I didn't know. I mean, I knew as much about the situation as you do right now. Mm. So I had to do something and I, I did this out of desperation, which quite frankly, is how I get a lot of my ideas. I mean, it's like, I got to do something right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the way, it's one of the reasons I like to play jazz because it's always like, okay, what do you do right now? So mm -hmm. anyway, there's a flip chart there. And I said, hey, everybody here knows somebody coming to that meeting, right? And they said, yeah. And I said, what's going to be on their minds? Now I'm just fishing at this point, mm -hmm. so, you know, and they, I couldn't write fast enough mm. all the stuff they were telling me. And, and so I ended up filling up this sheet of paper with just a lot of stuff. And I said, all right, so I taught those three levels. Let me use a green marker. Which of these have to do with information level one? And, and by the way, everything that ended up on their list was negative. It isn't, it usually isn't that it's usually a combination, but for theirs, everything was negative. Mm -hmm. So I underlined anything that had to do with information or lack of information. And I said, okay, let me use a blue marker. Um, what, which of these are level two, which have to do with fear or excitement? And I underlined those. And then I, I'm not sure what the other third color was. Let's say it's red. And I said for level three, having to do with trust and confidence, underlined those. And the guy who had said the bomb is going to drop said, oh, that's why the bomb is going to drop. Hmm. And everybody looked at him. So what are you talking about? And he said, look at that. We designed that eight hour meeting to deal with level one issues, facts and figures, timelines, deliverables, like maybe 10% of their concerns on that list are level one. Mm. He said, everything else is fear and a real lack of trust in us. That's why we think the bomb is going to drop. Yeah. Now, and people, they're all agreeing. Here's what they did brilliantly. They turned to the consultant from Deloitte and me and said, could we take the next hour and redesign that meeting? And of course we said, yeah, they turned their chairs around. They didn't turn to Ross, who was my, the counterpart and say, Hey, do you have a good planning model we could use or meeting model? They didn't turn to me. They, they, all they needed was their own data in a way to make sense of their own data. Mm -hmm. And so during that hour, they redesigned the meeting, same people, everything, but they said, okay, here's the stuff we have to get across, but how do we do it in a way that doesn't scare them to death? And how do we do this in a way that might actually start to build, have their trust in us, you know, rise a bit. And they did it. They were very excited. They held the meeting the following week. Apparently it went really well. And that story, I mean, I tell that story a lot because it gives me hope. Mm -hmm. They didn't need to read another book. Right. Uh, they didn't need a lot of new tech. They didn't need new techniques. It's once they saw it, quite often they go, oh, that's why. Well, then here's what we ought to do. Mm -hmm. so. Wow. Yeah, no, I, I like that. I think there's some great takeaways there. I think about, you know, kind of my own experience and um, starting my career in Fortune 500 organization, um, very bureaucratic. Um, and, and so I can, I can relate to the need um, and, and just kind of the friction there on something like that. Um, but, you know, really, I think what excites me about hearing stories like that is um, whether it's one on one or in a group setting, you know, whether you're a, a leader working with an individual on your team or whether you are a group of people, you know, with some kind of influence on another group that this applies. Right. I mean, this is mm -hmm. this is relevant. Yes. Regardless of. Yes. What so in in present day, Rick? Who are you working with most? Like, how would you characterize 
um, you know, the, the clients or kind of where you spend most of your time? Okay. Well, because of COVID, a lot of the, the actual client work, uh, I wouldn't say dried up, but it got a lot less. And frankly, I was helping a friend finish a music book and I wrote my, uh, another book in my field, which came out this year. And I was really happy doing all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but most of my clients tend to be leaders at pretty senior levels in very large organizations. And the, what I found is like working like a fortune 100 company, often these very senior people have lots of responsibility. They may, I remember one woman, her team was on four continents. And if you looked at the annual report for that company, you would never see her name. Hmm. Even though if you pulled what she was doing, which I think was a billion dollars of business out, it could be its own company. Hmm. And in some ways she felt like a middle manager. And it's just, it's something that happens in big organizations. So I love working with people who've got a lot of responsibility and they got to answer to somebody else and, and that kind of dilemma. Uh, so those tend to be the people that I work with. I, I have nothing against really small organizations, but uh, it's it, it generally it's not very cost effective for them to do that. I've got I got tons of free stuff on my website. And I mean, really, it's stuff that I hope people will use and can say, hey, I really like that. Thanks a lot. And so, yeah, that's awesome. Which, by the way, we'll have re we'll have the website and your contact information, all that fun stuff in the show notes. Super. Let's, listening. So you mentioned your book. Let's talk about that for a second. What's the okay. title there? It's called Seizing Moments of Possibility, Ways to Trigger Energy and Forward Momentum on Your Ideas and Plans. Okay. okay. When yeah. did that launch? Earlier this year, you said? Uh, April. I launched it at a uh, the Copenhagen annual change conference. I was a keynote there when the first one they did five years ago. And they said, hey, would you like to... Uh, you know, help us this time and be a keynoter. And I said, to that, you know, my book's about out. Could I launch it? You say, oh, that'd be great. Wow. So it was really fun. And what I did with the book is the ebook version of it is free and it's available on my website. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to keep it free. And so in other words, I, right now I have no plans to put it on Kindle uh, for that because I, you can't keep it free and keep it on, put it on Kindle. But I do have a paperback version and I have an audio book version for, on Amazon for sale. But, but the thing I really want is people to look at the free version and then to tell their colleagues and then they start using it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would make me really happy. So, so you want to hear about what the book is about? Yeah, that's where I was headed. Yeah, okay, what's, what's right. the, what are some of the main takeaways? Okay, well, so first of all, those three levels, that whole thing, that's the foundation piece for everything I do. But here... I really started looking at, so we have so many good resources out there on change management that have been around for, you know, over two decades. And I've got a couple shelfs of, of stuff. And I really started looking at why do people I respect still have a hard time kind of getting the support and keeping the support. And they've got this access to the same resources that I do. Um, and what's getting in the way. And so as I looked at it, um, and these are people who are sincere about really wanting to build support. There are some people who just go through the motions because somebody said they should do that. That's, I have, I can't help them. Mm. Uh, and there are people who just don't think it's stupid and they don't want to do it. So obviously they don't call me either. Uh, but there are a lot of people who say, yeah, it's important and I want to do it, but stuff gets in the way. And I think what gets in the way is is time that often when people are leading change or on a project team, they're told to do that along with everything else they've already been doing. They, they don't take a thing off the plate or nobody helps them take that off. Hmm. And so they're just, they're going from meeting to meeting to meeting and they're saying, how do we get through this meeting today? And so they, they look at whatever plan they have, which might be a perfectly good plan. And okay, we got to make sure, as one client said to me, said, yeah, yeah, what we'll do in this meeting today is we'll turn to, you know, step 42 and we'll go, okay, fill in this template, reorder these priorities, but it's just get the job done and move on. And as right. the CEO said to me one time, 
He said, all I was getting is malicious compliance. People were doing just enough. So mm. I came up with this idea. I think we need to do a, a I hate to even say better job because I don't think we do it much at all, but we'll do a better job of blending support into the plan itself, into the activity. Right now, if we do it, it's an add-on when we have time. And so my image for that is a barista. So I have a coffee shop just down the road and they're open again. And I'll go there and I'll get in line and there's always somebody there who orders a latte. And never once have I heard that person go, oh, hey, uh, give me a latte, but uh, hold the milk. Because mm. you can't do that. Mm -hmm. A latte is a blend of steam milk and espresso, period. You can have sprinkles and all kinds of extraneous stuff, but the two essential ingredients are coffee and, and milk, period. And if you're missing either one of those, you don't have a latte. Mm -hmm. And so the book is about, all right, so how do we blend the human part into every small moment mm -hmm. of what we do during a change? And mm -hmm. I've got a couple of examples, but I, I you know, want to, I, I want to give you a chance to go wherever you want to go with this right now. Yeah, no, I mean, I, if you're willing, I'd, I'd love to hear some examples. I think that, okay, um, right. in, in principle, I'm, I'm super interested in what you're Okay, so I have a client, a nuclear physicist. Uh, I do not consult with him on nuclear physics, physics so <laughs> the, wor the world is safe. Uh, <clears throat> the, um, but he, he knew that I really don't like PowerPoint as a tool to try to influence people. I mean, I think it's a good tool for some other things, but I think it just puts people to sleep. And he said, he said, you know, he said, I agree with you, Rick. The problem is if I have an idea and I'm trying to get support for it or like money for it and time and all of that from my professional colleagues. If I don't use PowerPoint, they think I'm not prepared. He said, that's sort of our corp corporate culture. And I said, well, I, that, yeah, that's, that's tricky. Well, he called me a couple of weeks later and said, I got it. I figured it out. He said, I had this big presentation and I thought, all right, typically I would use 50 slides. And that's a lot of content for, and especially a scientific presentation. He said, and I wondered, what's the minimum number I could use? And they would know that I prepared. And he said it was five. Mm -hmm. And he said, here's the amazing thing. I had five slides. I covered all the content. But because I wasn't beholden to slide after slide after slide, there was room. There was room for conversation for people to say, well, are you talking about this or that? And he said, by the end of the meeting, they were engaged, they were excited, we're talking about this together. And he said, usually people are asleep. Now, the only thing it changes in that meeting is the same people, the same room, the same bad coffee. It's just, he found a way to open it up. So it was an experiment, it might not have worked, but it was a simple thing that could allow energy to get into the room. So. I love that example. Yeah. My, my other one that I really love, it's, it comes from a company called Rhino Foods. Uh, they make dessert ingredients. So they sell to manufacturers like Ben and Jerry's and other companies like that. They don't sell to consumers. And it's a family run company. At the time they had about 90 employees and the owner held a meeting with everybody. And he said, I have some really bad news. He said, our industry has taken a huge downturn. And it's just, it's really, you know, it, it's just, we just don't have the money coming in to pay our bills. And he said, I've really looked at every place I can think of to make cuts and I've done everything I know to do. And the only thing left to do, and he said, I hate to say this is downsize. Now I've been in those meetings before and usually it, it could be a really good leader. It could be a really bad leader, but they want to get off the stage as quickly as possible because they're just uncomfortable. I mean, mm. you, know, you can't blame them. And he said, I, he said, it hurts me to say this. I wish I had it all. He said, I've thought, I think I've thought of everything. Here's where the blending in came. And I think it was an afterthought on his part. He said, if any of you have an idea that th you think might either make us money or save us money, I, I really, uh, I'm willing to consider it seriously, mm. but uh, he said, I think I've tried everything, but, but I'm open, right? 90 people. He got 111 suggestions. Mm. 
And so he put a group together and said, what can we do with these? And they ended up coming up with, I think, three major uh, strategies to use. Mm. And they got through that whole downturn with no downsizing. A couple of years later, there was another downturn. They just pulled that off the shelf. They did it, no downsizing. It was a simple thing of saying, hey, if you got ideas, I'm open. Mm. It was no big promise or anything, mm -hmm. but it's that ad it's adding humanity into the, into the meeting. Right. And it would be so easy to go. I'm really sorry, folks, but thanks. The head of HR will come, you know. Right. So. Yeah. Wow. No, that's powerful. Yeah. I like if I understand kind of the the main thesis or, or theme here is that we're talking about the ability to kind of detach from um, some kind of pre-rehearsed or, or um, some kind of fixed way of doing things or seeing things and, and just kind of being in the moment understanding things being open-minded and and stop me if i'm mischaracterizing anything i'm just trying to regurgitate my understanding of it i yeah i think i think we're on the same page with this it's um you can be you can have an agenda you can be have, be planned but saying but even asking the questions so what do we do <laughs> what do we do to keep people awake I mean, that would be a simple kind of thing. But what do we do to, is there anything we could do to engage people in this? Yeah. You know, these kind of meetings usually are sleepers. What do we do? Yeah. And I mean, it just, and just the asking that question, you know, uh, I, I was right before the pandemic, I was working with an organization. They said, we, we need to have a town hall meeting where we're bringing all the staff in. And basically we're gonna answer the questions. Okay, fair enough. It's still one-way communication, by the way, answering questions. Uh, it's not a bad thing to do, but don't confuse it with conversation. So at any rate, so the idea is that they would they would make really short presentations and then they would use the rest of the time uh, for Q&A. And I'm sitting on the side because I'm not there to facilitate and the time is running out. Mm -hmm. And whoever was in charge said, wow, We've only got 10 minutes left. Well, we've got a time for a couple questions. And the whole purpose of this was supposed to be Q&A. Mm. Now, they did go a few minutes over, but still, I mean, the whole purpose was to engage people. Mm. You know, find out where it hurts. Find out where they're confused, all of that. But they used it to talk at people. And, and, and part of they could say, well, they need to know this. Yeah, okay. But you need to know, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's just... Just that stopping and saying, if I just saying, if I were in that audience, how would I be reacting? Mm -hmm. I mean, that can change. It certainly can change a lot for me. Like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, maybe they don't need yet another story. Maybe they don't need this. Maybe you know that sort of thing. Yeah. Wow. No, I love that. I, I think. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of hearing like you're one of the things that stuck with me. You're talking about earlier is like making time for um to to look at things differently like you know what i'm saying like taking time and, and then when you're talking about the example with the 50 slides made me think of the quote um i, I think it's attributed to you know henry david Thoreau and some others um but if i'd had more time i would have written a shorter letter right yeah uh, <laughs> um yeah i mean that's so true like in our day-to-day -day rhythm and it's particularly in the business world where you just kind of get used to going through the mechanics of certain things and don't a lot of a lot of time on on a on you know on average to uh just stop and think about things differently so i appreciate you sharing those examples yeah. I think. well the one thing i would add to that because it, it could be easy for people to go oh okay so i need to take extra time to do that no you don't it's just the same meeting like how do i do this same meeting a little bit differently mm. uh just one second So right there, that gave me two seconds to think, oh yeah, I wanted to ask him about. Yep. I mean, it's just, it's it's right there in front of us. It's it's the steam milk and it's the espresso. It's right there. So so how do I use how do I use that energy that's right in front of me? And you know, and it doesn't have to be a big deal. I mean, it just I would start really stay in your comfort zone to do it, but it's uh, I, I'm not gonna 
I got tons of examples in the book, and I'm always happy to tell more examples, but I think I've made my point, so I'll, I'll shut up. <clears throat> Thank you for being a part of this journey. Definitely subscribe and like. Check out Be A Catalyst on Instagram and on Twitter. Also, don't forget to check out the YouTube channel where you'll find videos in addition to the Catalyst podcast recordings that give a little bit more context around my heart for training, my heart for seeing early to middle managers and, and first time leaders really thrive and, and be a catalyst in the organization that they're in, in the project that they are after, everything that goes along with that. So thank you for being a part of this. Tune in for the next episode and remember, be you, be confident, be a catalyst.